Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel and Escape from the City on the ABC. And Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of the 2018 Property Investment Advisory Firm of the Year. All right, folks, you're on the Property Couch for each week. Ben and I bring you the Insider's Guide to Property Finance and Money Management. Hello, mate. Hello, mate. How are you going? Very good, very good. good. Welcome back to the couch. Well, thanks for having me back mate, for these 220-odd episodes. 223 today. 223. Not out. Keep asking me back. I'll keep coming back. Okay, you will get an invite every week with the genius that you bring to the table. But a uh, quick one. Yes. Um, just a shout out to those folks. Uh, thanks for watching Escape from the City last week. Oh, it yes. Was, uh, ver- the ratings were really great. So great show. Pres- did you watch it? No, I haven't no, got to it yet. It. I, um, I promise you I will watch it. Available on iView. Yes. I'll so get there and have a look at it. You, you know, I was on a plane mm-hmm. and I've been away. So yeah. apologies for that. I didn't even watch it, Ben. <laughs> You've <laughs> seen it before, though, haven't you? So there, there you <laughs> there go. Full, go. Full disclosure. Cool. Um, so today it's Q and A day, Ben. So yep, another Q and A. Bang bang. We had a webinar last night. Went really yep. really well. And what we've observed is a shout out last week that we asked for lots of questions that people gave um, about what they were, what challenges they were experiencing yep. in building a property in the current market. And I've got a heap. <laughs> so I figured <laughs> let's roll them over because there's a lot. And the good thing here is um, because of last night's event went so well, we're doing an encore tomorrow. Oh, okay. At Great. Two, two o'clock. Uh, two two o'clock. p.m. So Ivis will put some deets in the show notes if anyone wants to come and check that out. But um, and what's that webinar about? Uh, Just for the for those who weren't familiar with it. Okay, it's how to build a property portfolio in a downturn market. Beautiful. What happened with our light there, Ivis? Um, <laughs> and how to retire on two thousand dollars a week with having to renovate, redevelop, or give up your weekends, Ben. Beautiful. So check that out. Hey, yeah, uh, sell or hold one more week, Ben. Yes. There was a little promotion, so that's got a week TPC to go. TPC twenty for twenty percent off, mm-hmm. almost a hundred dollars off. A sell or hold report. If you really want to know the best markets in a country and compare them against your property that you're not certain about, it is the best tool with the best data to do that. Check it out, folks, sellerhold.com.au, and you can check that out with that um, code that Ben just talked about. Hey, um, as we go through these questions, Ben, yes. there is there is a, a, a bit of a theme right. um, around, there's, there's some technical stuff, but there's, there's a bit of a theme around, um, do I, don't I, do I put my toe in, do mm-hmm. I not put my toe in? So what I thought with my mindset minute theme today, I was trying to tie that in, Ben. And you guess what? I've even tied in my little did you know. Fair income. Fair income. All right. You didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. That's my did you know for the day. Let's wrap it up. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. See you next week. <laughs> well, oh, mate, I'm, I'm impressed that there is a loop in well, your... Yeah. Uh, can we go straight to that? I'm intrigued now. <laughs> no. so, all right. Um, so... Mindset minute. There was a guy um, that, uh, that I was recently in the States, and he was encouraging his son yes. to read from a young age, yep. to read personal development books. You remember that, I was? Okay. And so I thought, um, this guy is encouraged, he's, I think he's 16 or 17 now, he's got heaps of personal development videos on YouTube. I'm starting to think, maybe, maybe I'd better lift my game on, <laughs> <laughs> on uh, encouraging uh, my kids. So what I've been doing lately is reading with Jack, Who Moved My Cheese? Classic book, I've yep. quoted it in the past. Yep. But uh, it, what was interesting, I was going through the book, and I don't know if you, have you read the book? No, who, sorry, I haven't read who, the book. Who Moved My Cheese? It's a parable, right? Yes, got and it. And it's... Cheese represents, you know, a good job or love, loving relationships, money or health, whatever it yep. is, right? love it. Now, I'm going through It's a little tiny book. You can smash through it pretty quickly. We're about two-thirds of the way through it, and I'll get through to the finale tonight with him. Beautiful. And I'm reading through it, right? And the beginning is a little bit sort of boring for young kids because it's like a couple of people at a dinner party, and it's like, and he's like, Dad, where's the pictures? <laughs> <laughs> there's no pictures in the book, right? And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going well. You know, this is my... Uh, yeah. And then we get to the bit about the cheese and he's hooked in. So every now and then I circle back, what cheese station um, C. Yeah, no, there's no cheese there, Dad. Got to move the cheese station N. So it's pretty good. And that doesn't Got mean it. anything to you. But no. for those who have read it, yes. it means something. So what is Who Moved My Cheese, Ben? It's about Sniff and Scurry, who are mice. Yes. And Hem and Haw, who are the little people, right? Right, yeah. Now, Sniff is sniffing out new um, ideas. Scurry makes sure they happen. So yep. that's with the, the, the pivot for the change. And Hem and Haw, that's that term for indecisiveness. And that's how they flow through the book. Yep. Now, 
a couple of things. Instead of seeing change as the end of something, um, we must learn to see it as the beginning. So that's a theme in, yep. in the book. Yep. Um, so as Hoare's going through the maze, I was thinking that through, um, Hoare was going, if you do not change, you become extinct. So I'm going somewhere with this, Ben, so hang Good. in there. So for life not to be wasted, it demands a level of risk and adventure, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, are, if you are willing to live this way, change actually loses its horror. So the advancing perp uh, person purposely creates change because the, the, the world is not currently how they would like it. Mm -hmm. So what the little men, him and Hoare discover is that breaking through their fears, Ben, mm. of being stuck in this chi this cheese station, um, sets them free. So, there's some lessons, right? Oh, here's here's the good point too, Ivis. Just wait for this. Yeah. Those who continually seek security, Ben, ironically, are racked by the possibility that they may lose it. And the cheese mm, station for the couple, they were, they were hanging around the cheese, they didn't see the signs that the cheese were diminishing and then all of a sudden they were getting all panicky because, oh, who moved my cheese? Where's it gone? All right, so lesson number one, change happens. They keep moving the cheese, right? Mm -hmm. So how does that re relate to us? Well, the government keeps changing, Ben, for as long as I can remember. They changed uh, tax rates back in 2000 with the GST. Our good mate Bradley Beer uh, almost choked on his dinner you know, yep. the 9th of May a couple of years ago when they changed depreciation. They changed travel. And lo and behold, we've got uncertainty around negative gearing changes, mm -hmm. the lending landscape where the brokers are going to lose their commissions, yep. where all that sort of stuff. Yep. But the reality is that change happens, Ben. They keep moving the cheese, so you need to embrace it. Lesson number two, anticipate the change, Ben. Get ready for the cheese to move. We've talked about this before, where you have uh, white water uh, in business. People often expect to be clear water, but there's big surf out there, but it's around the white water. So yep. lesson number two, anticipate change. Number three is monitor the change. So... Listen to podcasts, Ben, or go and see your investment savvy mortgage broker if you're struggling with lending. So anticipate it and see it and plan for these things. Lesson number four, adapt quickly to change. The quicker you let go of the old cheese, the sooner you can enjoy new cheese, Ben. Ooh, All right. Like so you've got the people who wait and see, Ivis, but there's also those people who adapt and pivot. They've already moved on. They're already mm -hmm. seeing potentially negative gearing changes on the horizon. So what can I do now to actually plan for that? Lesson five, move with the cheese. Change from the mindset of, oh, that's unfair, oh, that's not going to work too. What can I actually do about it? And lesson number six, Ben, enjoy the change. Savor the adventure and enjoy the taste of new cheese. Because only one thing's constant, Ben. Well, two, two things, two. isn't it? Yeah, tax and change. No, three. Oh, what's the third? Collingwood death. losing premierships? Okay. Death. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Exactly. Taxes and deaths are the constant, but change is also. And in, in this century... You know, there's, the change is going to be a lot more rapid mm -hmm. than people have ever seen before, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, mate, that was great. Like, can you just keep going? I just want to take a seat. Oh. I'm loving this stuff. Keep going. I, uh, I actually watch you when I go through the Mindset Minute, Ivers, and sometimes he just glazes over a bit and he thinks about what he's doing next. And But you're into that, so I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. Oh, don't just glaze over that. I appreciate the attention. That's statement. That's an outrageous <laughs> statement. So I think that as a backdrop, Ben, why did I go through that lengthy Mindset Minute today? Because I think it serves as a very good backdrop to some of the questions we're about to face today. Love it. Well done. Fantastic stuff. Now, just also, I didn't. you did note about change. Newsflash. Yeah. The Liberal Party. Oh, yes. Have made another big change earlier this week. They on did. Tuesday, Tuesday, we heard mm. the news that no longer is trail going to only last until the 1st of July 2020. Of July. It's going to go for three years. And then they're going to review and it. And then they're going to review it. Imagine that. Which I think is common sense mm. in regards to, you know, you, you were seeing all different types of attempts at this with upfronts in the UK and they just went to churning, you know, so that's not necessarily in the no. best interest of the customer. But they do believe that bro brokers provide competition and good outcomes for clients. And so that is good news from the current government of the day. If, uh, if they stay in power, that's where they will land in terms of their recommendations. So to all those people who have used a broker before and have been satisfied with a broker and want to see more competition and cheaper finance out there, then that's a good news story. I've obviously been on um, Phil's podcast, um, Smart Property Investor Show, and we talked about that. Yeah, talk about a, it. it was a good you know, one. We full, put it disclosure, the episode. full disclosure, I am a broker. Mm -hmm. I'm a licensed broker. Um, we have a brokerage business here. That is good news 
for us to be able to continue to invest in all the things that we do. And we've talked about the spend we're going to be spending on innovation. A lot of that has come from the money we get to invest back into helping people manage their money. That means managing their mortgages, which means control and cash flow, which means putting money to work, which means creating wealth, which means less burden on the government. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things are good stories. Which better lifestyle design. So well, yeah, well said, Ben. And that was, um, yeah, it kind of makes sense that they just took mortgage brokers off the radar for the for the banking infidelity. Yeah, I think it's been a wake up call. I think you know there wasn't much in there for what mortgage brokers would do. Introducers were a problem. Mm-hmm. A couple of there wasn't any systemic issues with how brokers were looking after their clients. So I think it's a, it's a sensible move, and you know. The marketplace will tell you. And the market's a pretty good indicator of want and need. And when 59%, almost 60% of people use a broker, that's a pretty good story. Mm, it's a good sign, isn't it? All right, so our first question today, and we're going to give, yes. away, we're going to give away books too, Ben. So let's Great. see how many we Fantastic. can give away. If we read out your question, reach out to us. We'll let you know. Uh, this is from Willow Lee. I've spent the last six months researching the property market and listening to you guys. I feel like I'm now armed with information. I'm too scared to enact anything because I also know how wrong things can go. I'm feeling a bit where to from here. Now, Ben, I've got to say that is almost quote for how Hem was feeling about the cheese station C. Ah, yes. It's all about moving to cheese station N. Mm. So I think Willow might be able to relate to the uh, the parable that exists in that book. But um, question, do you remember... um, and you tell me if I'm if I'm asking something you don't want to talk about. But do you remember when you bought your house? Mm-hmm. In which one? The one you currently live in. Yep. In the GFC. Yep. Do you do you remember what the um, what the feeling was like for you at the time going swimming against the tide? So at, at that time, because my mindset has changed significantly, having bought several and feeling more comfortable, right? So walk a mile, see a mile. Yep not so bad right so um and it was also quite opportunistic because it had passed in an auction for a million and fifty and i bought it for nine hundred and thirteen thousand. Mm. um so but if you had asked me what i felt like the first property i bought mm. um across the road from mum and dad well i was going to ask you about the first one right but yeah, then yeah, i yeah. thought well but you, you wasn't necessarily in the same conditions that we're experiencing now where people are fearful of what's going on in the marketplace externally rather than their own little internal demons because on the first one you're usually just fighting against yourself true but it but it's still it's still the same principles right because Mm. ultimately this is consistent with human behavior and human psychology when people are fearful they 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 don't take action Mm -hmm. right so um it's consistent when markets are crashing that's the best time to get in. So it, it is about swimming against the tide, right? And a lot of people find it very difficult because they don't have the tools um, and the training and the mindset to be able to take that opportunity forward. So, um, you know, we've always said that when you look at the broader spectrum of opportunity in the property market, there's going to be more people living in Australia. We're going to welcome, you know, potentially another 10 million people here in the next sort of 10, 15 years, that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So our population is going to grow by approximately a third, another third. So, okay, that's broad. Now, that means that there's going to be more accommodation. Will we oversupply that accommodation? Traditionally, we've always undersupplied because property just can't grow like that. You know, it takes 26 weeks to build a house usually, and that's a a, a fairly quick manufactured house for good renos and and purpose craft hand built properties takes about a year to build those so that's one you know so it takes longer in Mooney Ponds doesn't it the uh, the, the renovation well we did it in three (laughs) stages we couldn't afford to do it all in one stage I was thinking of stage three there no no well stage three did take almost a year yes Mm. Um, and so that's I suppose that's the question right in terms of so so uh, Willow you're in the same boat as the majority of people Mm -hmm. And that's why the majority of people aren't taking action. And we are trying to, with this podcast, talk to the minority, all right? So if we've got 30,000 people listening to this, we know that on average, 3,000 people will probably take advantage of what we're talking about right now, right? That's the message. And there'll be others who'll be sitting there waiting 
and they'll be saying to themselves, is this me or not yet? I'm not ready, I'm not, until they see confidence and then that's what happens and that's when the market runs because everyone's like, oh, now I'm gonna miss out, so now I've gotta act. This is a great time to act. Well, you sign off on it with um, knowledge is empowering, but only mm. if you act on it. Um, yeah. There was a, a term I was exposed to recently called the information loop. And, you know, can, people can get on the information loop and be quite happy with that. I know the frameworks. I know that we're getting population. I know that I need, can plan for what yeah. I need. I know that I, if I can cash flow, I get the finance right. But it's just the, the, um, the addiction of knowing that I'm in that loop and feeling connected and knowing, yeah. but not actually stepping over the line because you said you, you rattled off some numbers right you but you did 10 percent of people might actually do something yeah the, i challenge any listener who is in that teaching loop or that information loop where you actually do know a hell of a lot you know that the population is strong you know yeah. what properties to buy you know you've got to get scarce you know they could verbatim rattle off all of the principles that we have on our podcast and yet they're still stuck on that yeah. loop. The, They've got to step off. The only one that will keep me on that information loop is job security brass mm-hmm. um, and cash flow. Mm-hmm. So, you you know, we we get people into debt to, to have a leverage position, um, just like businesses borrow money to hopefully accelerate and get a better return on the money that they're borrowing. We see no difference in that. We think, why can't people, why can't mum and dads or individuals have the opportunity to take advantage of sensible, productive leverage, mm-hmm. right? But it, it does heighten risk, um, it also heightens reward. I mean, you know, I, I, my first 10 or 15 years doing this, I still let some great ones go. I mean, there was a block of dirt in Perth that I could have bought for 300 grand that in the peak of the Perth market, I could have sold for a million. Mm-hmm. And that's just a block of dirt. Mm. I didn't have any income coming off, and that was, it was almost three and a half years later. It went from 300 to selling from, now I think I could pick that block of dirt up now for probably about 600. Uh, it's a four block site, so I can do four townhouses on it. Now, I didn't want to do that, or something stopped me from doing that. Whereas my data didn't, I mean, I knew what was going on, right? It's 80 meters to the beach, mm. right? You know, and a nice, Scared. safe beach, right? So good for families. Uh, in terms of rental, it's out of Perth, so it was like 25 minutes, 30 minutes out of Perth, but still... Was this the one you keep going by every I'd, second well, year just to check it out? The, 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 the <laughs> father-in-law and mother-in-law own the house across the road, oh, no. so I get to see it every day. <laughs> okay. Oh, that, that one there, I yeah, that bought one. that one. Yep. Yep. yep, there we go. So look, it happens to the best of us, right? But I've just made sure now, and, and our job is to educate people on what is a smart move and what is wrong with. Now, that one there, again, was volatile, right? It wasn't, the fundamentals weren't perfect on that. I wasn't close to town, but that was a manufactured piece. And it just so happens that Perth was booming, you know, in the lead up to the mining boom. It was crazy times over there, right? So if I had have jumped on when I thought I would, but I just didn't have the confidence to do it because it was a foreign market to me at that point, but the data, and all of the science that I knew about scarcity in that area stacked up, but I just didn't do it. Yeah, my confidence was ill-placed on my first one. Ben, I talked about it in the webinar last yeah. night where I, the first one I purchased was zero emotions, just I had to get one. I believed all the theory and I just sort of had to put my name on a title and yeah, you yeah. soon realised that uh, over time, <laughs> a couple of my first decisions weren't that great. But um, yeah, uh, again, travel with, with looking in the rear vision mirror of what we could have done and we're trying to educate people in these times to sort of say, great opportunity to look at. Yeah, I think the uh, the first property I purchased was probably the worst result, Ben, but I consider it my greatest property investing achievement mm. because I got off the information loop and I actually stepped out and yeah, did it. Yeah, now, yeah. I'd like to think that uh, with the information that's available now, I could make a better decision if I was to rewind. Yep. But yep. the point is that, um, uh, Willow, we hear you. And to be honest, there's probably a whole bunch of people listening to this who also hear you who feel the same way. But um, in terms of a feeling, uh, you know, you, the, the last part you said, I'm feeling a bit of where to from here. Well, where to from here is this. Um, get clarity on your well-formed outcome. Where do you want to go? Mm-hmm. Um, reverse engineer what that looks like. Um, find out if you've got good job security. Find out if you've got any surplus cash flow. And find out if you've got any borrowing capacity. And once you step through each and every one of those stepping stones across the creek, you'll actually get to the other side because then you will know where to from here. Because now is you know, a very, very interesting time to be buying real estate because um, the people who are brave now in five years time are gonna look back and go, wow, Mm. look at the quality of the asset that I was able to get in that time when the competition was less because I made sure that I could borrow, had cash flow, had job security, and I knew where I was headed. uh, We were talking about it during the week where we said, 
to the point where we feel like this is so like um, uh, press press uh, play on what we've said for the last 223 episodes. Yeah, it's it's still um, a basic fundamental that some people really need to grasp mm. onto so they can step off that information loop. Well, I mean, you know, the business has been around for a long time, Bryce. But I remember writing the blogs that I used to write in 2007, 2008, 2009 during the GFC period. Yep. And I used to scream in my typing at people, are you crazy? Yeah. Do you not understand that it doesn't get any screaming, yelling, you know, forcing these people to read my content? Just <laughs> come get on, there. come on, <laughs> get on the game. And lucky, now, you, lucky you didn't have a podcast back then, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Come but, on. But now, that's it, I'm over screaming, right? Yeah. I'm now at a stage like, look, take the information, I encourage you to do something with it, but if you don't, that's your fault, not mine. I mean, I can only do so much. So I'm getting a little bit tighter in the, come on, you yeah, can do it. Yeah. Just like, take the information, and information is empowering. A little bit of wisdom in those uh, grey hairs over there, brother. <laughs> Very All good. All right, what do we got next? Book for Willow. Book for Willow. Reach out to us. Yeah. Let us know. But I don't think we're doing that great on giving away books because how, how long are we in? And we only got through one question, either, so let's keep moving. <laughs> yeah. So here's one from Luke Frost. Yes. Um, listening to all the podcasts on one and a half speed, owning own home at an LVR of 73%, getting good savings in the offset, money smarts in effect, Beautiful. both working for the government so jobs are safe and predictable, just knowing how and where to take the plunge when all the people, media, banks, etc., are telling you you're doing a great job. Why risk it? By extending to another house. <laughs> oh, wow. Luke. Luke. Um, well, that's a question for you and your family to work out. I mean, the reason why you risk it is the reward that you will get um, if you do something about um, extending yourself. Okay? That's... Uh, but it's... But, you try to mitigate as much risk as you possibly can through your defensive strategies. But there's a couple of pieces here. You know, in, ter in terms of um, where do I buy? Um, what do I buy? If you're not quite sure, then get some help. Seek professional help. But because like, like everyone says, and I, I like the way Jeremy describes it, there's only one best property in Australia each year. The rest of them are secondary to that very best one. And if anyone's telling you that they're going to buy you that very best property, that one in, what is it, you know, 500,000 transactions that occur, well, they're full of crap, right? So just avoid them. What you're better off sort of saying is, I want to be in the bucket of properties that are going to perform well over the medium to longer term, mm -hmm. right? And um, what does that look like? Well, you just need to go back and listen to our podcast, but it's pretty simple from our point of view. It's we want to pro, pro, uh, buy properties that have some strong owner occupier appeal that potentially give us some land content uh, that give us great location and amenity and all of those lifestyle drivers and potentially some status with that. Now we realise that that's not you know in every city um, and regional town there are pockets like that, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the big cities. I mean, escape from the city, right? You find some of the great areas that are the best streets in those towns and mm -hmm. they can also work as well. Mm -hmm. Now, will you get city growth? No, because you probably don't get the income growth, but the people who are in those bigger regional towns, there's enough in that area that pushes those values higher than, the, than some of the other streets and some of the other neighborhoods in that regional town as well. So the principles are still the same and if you're getting five, six percent compounding growth per annum, you are going to transform your life. Yeah, because I was going to say, you know, you've got safe jobs now. You're yeah. not going to have safe jobs forever. So there's no, there's no benefit in having a fully paid off home that you had safe jobs all the way through so you could predictably pay off your mortgage. And then you get to a point where you no longer earn an income and you don't have one. You, you are facing down the barrel of re relying yeah. on other people. So... Um, it, I think Ben said it beautifully at the top. It depends on what's important to you, Luke. But ultimately, if you have a if you have a well formed outcome, which is how much passive income you would actually like to have when you no longer trade your time for money at whatever point in time that is, if you actually want to have that, you will need to get into a position where you do more than just paying off your home. Because unless you have a, an extraordinary income stream from having your own principal place of residence that will give you in excess of what you need. Chances are you need to leverage into something 
And for us, it's residential real estate. So, And if you're not quite sure and you don't want to use third party for whatever reason, there is tools out there. We've built them because we knew that everyone's not going to go and pay for professional advice. We know that. The science tells us that 25% of the population will seek out and pay for advice, right? Mm -hmm. And most of the businesses in this world and successful businesses will do the same. Success does leave clues. But for those people who want to be DIY and want to learn the craft themselves, you still need to put your money in your pocket. I used to buy RP uh, Residex reports. Mm. You know, I, I bought several of those Residex reports. I bought lots of things around the 100, 200, 300, 400, thousand dollar ranges to build out my yep. knowledge when I was learning my craft. I mean, that's my university degree mm -hmm. right there in terms of getting my hands on as much content. And some of the best content has a paywall. So you've got to get behind the paywall, grab that information and form out your knowledge. And from that, it'll improve your chances of picking a better area that's going to give you the return you're looking for. Very good. So there you go, Luke. Uh, you said, why risk it by extending to another house? We're going to send you the Armchair Guide to Property Investing. There's some case studies at the back there. Yes. That explains very, very succinctly why you would risk it by extending to another house so that you can have some form of payoff in the future. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Mark McNamara, write to us. He said, worried that I am too old, Ben, at 58, to keep buying and increasing debt versus paying down debt on four properties owned. Mm. Probably right there, Mark. Mm. I don't need, I, I mean, I don't know your situation. There's a lot of moving parts in there so I just want to speak more generally to 58 year old and 60 year old and 65 year old people it would be case by case in terms of whether there is any logic in you acquiring another property or not and getting into that debt if you've got 10 to 15 years of working life to go and you want to then I would be open-minded right age should be no barrier uh, most people are going to be living to 80, 85. So if they want to work to uh, 70 uh, or whatever, that's fine. If they have to, in some cases, they might have to work to that. But there is a little clue in here for me that says I own four properties. Yeah. How much do you want, Mark? Yes. Right? I mean, what is the number for you? So I, I totally agree with you. Why acquire more? Now, you may have a couple of lemons in those four that you own. Uh, so that's something you've got to consider as part of your portfolio. But the reality is three or four good properties. I was about to say the <laughs> same thing, Ben, because uh, we don't know how long Mark's been listening to us, but we've made it very clear that it's a very conservative uh, approach that we take. And if uh, I'd say to Mark, if you're listening to this on Thursday, check out the Encore tomorrow because we show how we built a portfolio with three properties, Ben, mm. last night. We're going to do it again on the Encore. Um, so if they've already got four, might be enough. And Mark, do this. This is a quick back of envelope calculation, right? Work out the amount of interest you're paying on your global debt, 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand. You retire that debt out, that 30 grand, 40 grand, 50 grand becomes yours. <laughs> so, you know, add that to whatever super you might have put away, then ultimately there's your passive income. And the reality is over time, you'll be able to you know, do market rent increases and that will grow over time as well. Plus you've got four assets there and there might be a transition out where you would sell one of those assets timed and you would talk to a financial planner and they would look at potentially putting that money into a super fund for you so you can then get that into a more um, effective Tax structure. Effective yep, and, and do everything legally and do all, and then all of a sudden you're set. But you need potentially some advice around that or don't necessarily buy any more. You don't need any more. Gone are the days where you need to be talking about 10, 15, 20 properties. It's, it's just, just not required. That's just ego. It is total mm. ego or mm. greed. Mm. It's one or the other. Mm. Very good, Marks. Let us know. We'll Sounded uh, like I was shouting there, didn't I? I mean, almost well, mate, I just felt like you were your, your typewriter. Right? Yeah. <laughs> mate, if you, if you weren't two-finger typing, you'd have smashed out a few blogs by now. So, all right, next one is from Joel Teggett. Yes. Finding that balance of a cash flow and capital growth potential property, very hard to find both, especially in this current market with not too many positive predictions for the near future. I think Andrew Wilson said um, uh, two or three weeks ago, man, it's about the property, it's not about the market. So mm. everyone's relying on you know this last bit, not too many positive predictions for the near future. Mm. Well, it depends who you're listening to. Because we've got some very strong predictions about the future. If you can, if you can find good assets now in the future, you're going to be very thankful that you've put them in your portfolio and you've got better assets when you've done that. So finding the balance of cash flow and capital growth property 
um, by nature, they're inversely proportional. Mm, um, yeah. So if you're, if you're looking for a needle in a haystack, that could be half the problem. But whether, what, again, we don't know enough about what Joel's trying to achieve here, but um, one of the questions that um, uh, Brad in our buyer's agency team gets here is, do you guys chase any, uh, are you only capital growth <laughs> all the time? And he's like, well, you, no, we, we're horses for courses. Some, yeah. But it's the game changer, right? It's the definitive way in which you can build out wealth. All things being equal, you'll All chase growth first. Every time. Round it out with income. But yep. we're not. We're certainly not saying that's our, you know, no. putting our nails on the mask by saying we are only capital growth property. So, Joel, do you need cash flow or do you need capital growth? And in which order? Because we have met people who do need income first, Ben. They yep. don't have enough. They get 100%. the income, they build it up, they build up a little nest egg, and then they can leverage that. I had someone recently reach out and say, hey, look, I've realised my portfolio is heavily cash flow biased. I've tipped it around. That's fine. Because now we can go and chase the capital growth property. There's enough time left for them to do that. So I would say um, uh, that by nature, growth assets usually attract a, a lower yield, and yielding assets usually attract a lower growth. Um, there are sort of um, situations when that's there not always the case. There were times in the cycle where a yield asset will grow. Yep. <laughs> that is and, true. And we got clients who have bought that. Yep. Because they, they bought it at the right time in the market. Correct. And there'll be times in the cycle where capital growth properties will go nuts mm. and your yield will be crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the beautiful part about that is, is your rent will accommodate that and your loan to value ratio will go down and you'll eventually get to a positive cash flow property quicker. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the minutia. In, in terms of what we're talking about here. So if you are trying to find that nirvana, that needle in the haystack, as you were saying before, that's the way to find it, right? That's putting cash flow and capital growth and thinking you're gonna get those two things concurrently at the same time. Um, you, you know, I could probably reference maybe a dozen times that I've seen it in 20 plus years, mm. but that's about it, right? Most of the time, build a portfolio, one growth, one year, one growth, if that's what you wanna do. And is that just, um, Joel, I, I'm throwing it out there, but is that just a, 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 a label or a, something that you're using to procrastinate to make sure that you don't actually take action? I can't Good find this care. particular property, Fair therefore point. I can't act. So is it, uh, is it boxed up with a pretty bow, but, but actually it's procrastination? We all want the best return, Bryce. I mean, that's why people say, well, the first question you always get, isn't it? Where's the next hotspot? <laughs> oh, that's the first question you get off people. Oh, I just want the next, you know, I just put all my money there because, so, but the reality from our point of view is, well, there are tools out there. Measuring demand and supply will get you into those hotspots mm -hmm. and they, you will find those areas, but will those hotspots be hot forever? No. Not, not when you're measuring short-term demand and supply. No. They will go through cycles and they can, you know, you might want to become a trader. If you're going to do that, then that's not necessarily perfect investing in our view. Joel, we'll send you a book, send it through. We will send that out to you now. Obviously, I have creative license about which um, questions I get to put in. So oh. this one has a bit for both of you in it, right? Okay. So this is from Andrew McFadden. Uh, subject title, biggest challenge question mark. Then it says Collingwood supporters with two exclamation marks, oh, which is nice. So I'm feeling it, Andrew. I'm feeling the love for us. Yep. Uh, morning. <laughs> well, your biggest challenge is getting the stick to talk. Is yes. that right? Are you going to say anything onto that, Ives? No right reply. Mm -hmm. His biggest challenge is, you know, I'm in my early 40s, married with two. We own our property, our principal place of residence outright, and also two very yield-rich two-bedroom flats. I thought he was about to say two very, ri very rich, or oh, yield-rich kids. Oh. I thought that's quite smart. <laughs> I thought that was, that was very funny when I first looked at it. Very two yield rich kids. Well, most of them are. But <laughs> yes, you, no, we're talking about flats. Two bedroom flats. So being very conservative on current price would have more than 20% equity in investment properties alone, ignoring the principal place of residence, Ben. Hmm. Working out yield would be approximate uh, purchase price of 235 and 245. Uh, we haven't owned them very long, just a few years, but not much capital growth regardless. Both purchased in hometown in God's country of very northern New South Wales, 20 minutes from the coast, 30 minutes from Byron. I actually do think that's God's own country. With a rent of 265 on the 235 purchase mm -hmm. and 315 on the 245 purchase. So the yields are 5.8% and 6.6% respectively. Yep. Body corporate costs are reasonable to both under 2K a year. I have been going over in my head about the sell and buy opportunity costs, but the yields are just too good and in under three years, we have two properties that combined will be paying themselves off by the end of the financial year. Mm -hmm. After all, 
sorry, after all that, with me knowing my next property has to be a growth strategy, I'm struggling to take that next step, Ben. It will need to be borderless and I'm comfortable with Brisbane, but I'm not comfortable making a next purchase that will tie me up in terms of next purchase for several years. I love property and it's annoying that we can only get to transact every few years. My fear, oh, there's that word, Ben, mm -hmm. is by the time I have that property under control due to the time frame, will everything change? Question mark, question mark. Mm. If the government ever invests in more light rail as they have done a little on the Gold Coast or fast rail, etc., will that CBD fringe property not go back or grow at a rate it has? As your sensational podcast kept saying that the last 50 years have been the best time to invest in bricks and mortar, but with my next purchase being more expensive than my principal place of residence, I'm nervous about what the future holds. So my challenge would be mindset, I suppose, but as you see, although we have a very conservative approach, not purchasing an investment property until owning the principal place of residence outright, we have taken action and jumped on the train. I have the Warren Buffett quote ringing loud in my head right now as I feel we are financially able to make a move when others are fearful, but going from yield to growth and the gap between purchases is the, ch is the challenge for me slash us. Thanks. And by the way, I taunted a customer who had Collingwood signs all through her office only yesterday. I feared for my life. <laughs> Cheers, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, there's a bit to unpack here. There is let's a go bit. Back, let's go back to where we're talking about these. See? You can still buy properties for 235 or 245,000 flats in regional New South Wales. With good yield. Good yields, great yields. In fact, great yields for the time of the market we see. But what did he say? With little capital growth. Mm. There will be a spike in capital growth over the next 20 years for that market. Not knowing where it is, but you can almost guarantee that the growth won't stay stagnant forever. So Joel, there's your point there, right? That's one or the other. They are in, in a way mutually exclusive and don't normally happen at the same time. So that refers into that point. Uh, then when we start talking about um, it has to be growth. Now, mm -hmm. growth is the game, right? If, you, if, you, if we're all serious about that. And I noticed also he talked about they own their principal place of residence outright and have 20% equity in their investment properties. Now, Andrew, if you were my client, um, I would be saying to you, you are fearful of letting go of your money. Now, you, but you've made a couple of executions on that, but only on the, on the fact that it's effectively going to be cash flow neutral or cash flow positive. Inside three years, you'll have two properties that are paying for themselves. So you are high risk adverse, and that's completely okay. Mm -hmm. So your challenge is to move from that high, low, uh, sorry, low risk in terms of not wanting to take too much risk, to move to a, a, a model Moderate. where you have to be out of pocket. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it does leave clues, right? When you paid for your principal place residence as outright, yep. boom, you are just, you're conscious of money, money is well managed in your household, you are paying debt, you, I, I get And in their early 40s. In their early 40s, looking pretty good. Mm. Now they could go after a couple more yield properties if it makes them feel comfortable. Yeah. And if that's the journey and pathway yep. that they want to go on, that's okay, yeah. but there is a trade-off. Remember that word that I like at the moment? Mm. The trade-off is potential capital growth cost, and that's what he's having trouble with down here. He then sort of says, infrastructure programs, if I do buy closer in and, and then a train, and I, and I commit my money up in Brisbane where nothing's gonna happen because it takes forever to things happen in Queensland, right? <laughs> and then there's something that's gonna happen in Melbourne or Sydney and I'm gonna go, oh! Yeah. That is opportunity cost, mm -hmm. right? And so why can't we buy properties every year? I get it, but you can't. Okay, so the point being is if you can find peace and if anyone can find peace with the idea that your property is not the best in Australia, everyone got that? Not the best in Australia, but in a good bucket, in, you know, in that sort of eights, nines, tens range, then rest easy because that, that, those markets where that infrastructure program might run through, they're going to pop and then they're going to stagnate and then they're going to pop again and stagnate. They'll go through that economic cycle that everything goes through in, in the uh, capitalist economy that we operate in. So I'm not feeling any fear for you, Andrew. I'm just sort of saying it's about confidence and getting over your fear to take that action. And if you're not good enough at doing it, then outsource your knowledge to someone who is good enough to do it for you to get the results that you're looking to get. Because if someone did the models for you, you will understand that the opportunity cost could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not 
you know, bordering on a million over a 20 or 30 year period. Yeah, so Andrew, what is it that you're chasing is the number one? What, what are you aiming for? How much do you need? And um, I, think, uh, I think Ben... And you know the easiest way to solve this problem? Line up what's important to you and your family, Andrew. Sounds like you've got a wonderful family there. Wife's a couple of kids. Mm -hmm. Sit down and work out, design your life design, right? Sit down, work out all the big rocks in the jar, the things that are going to be important to you. Then that will give you an idea of the amount of money that you need. Okay, and then how are you going to go after that money? Will your super get you there? Terrific. If it does, and these two properties, will it get you there? If it doesn't, then you need to execute on one or two other things potentially. Then you can decide on what they look like in terms of that story. So I love this question because Andrew's being vulnerable. He's opening up to us. Mm -hmm. He's giving us a good sense of what his situation looks like. And again, he's got his principal place of residence owned outright. I don't think there will be a day wherever I own my, I own my principal place of residence <laughs> right. But by the by, you know, I've got a higher risk profile because I've moved through that knowledge spectrum and walked up the steps to understand where I sit in terms of understanding investment risk and return and reward. And so I take greater risks than Andrew does. Mm. Helpful, Andrew. Hope so. Let us know. We'll um, certainly send you a book and uh, I'll even get a Collingwood supporter to sign it for you. I reckon the, the armchair guide's best for you, Andrew, if you haven't already read it, because it shows you the power of compound and shows you a couple of case study models. I think your money management's all right, right? If you can nail yeah. debt as quickly as you guys have and you've got good incomes, safe jobs, all of those things, uh, chances are we don't have to teach you about money management. What we have to teach you about is opportunity cost. Very good, mate. Front row seat from a very, very uh, wise... Oh, one last thing, Andrew. Go pies. <laughs> I'm not going to continue with that uh, feedback I was about to give you, so it was going to be a positive reinforcement of your, uh, of your oh, skills, but stuff that. If you're going to go and spoil it with a Collingwood comment, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Hey, another Andrew for the next question. Andrew yes. Love. Without a doubt, so what's the challenge? Without a doubt, obtaining finance. We have two investment properties and a principal place of residence already with two different brokers have said we can't get further finance even though we have over a million in equity, Ben. Mm -hmm. Despite a combined income of 150000 the bank serviceability says we don't earn enough. Look forward to the show as always. Thanks for your service to the property investor community. Regards, Andrew. Well, Mr. Love, it's, it, we don't know your circumstances here, but I suspect you've got a fairly hefty owner-occupied debt. Mm. Right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, again, equity is not how you service existing or future debt. Um, it's just something that you can leverage against if you've got that income coming in. So, you know, how do we increase servicing capability? Um, second jobs, you know, uh, money hacks, different ways we can do that in terms of we've seen different ways in which people are doing it, Uber driving on weekends and nights to increase their incomes. Um, if you're desperate to retire early and you're willing to look at different alternatives to get secondary incomes, that's going to help as part of that story as well. Um, you know, your next purchase could be in conjunction, a joint venture with family, friends, a family or friends where they combine their income as well to improve servicing. If you're desperate to get ahead or Andrew, we don't know your age, but you could also just be, just wait. Times will swing around. You'll be able to get that, that servicing up into the future to go again as your properties grow and as you retire debt or continue to keep building out your offset account. Andrew, reach out to us. We'll get your book and um, let us know what you're, um, what you're chasing. We'd love to know how many, uh, what the yeah, passive be interested income in the numbers. and a little bit of your age profile so that we can get a better idea. Because that's, uh, Ben, that's the biggest challenge we have. Two yep. things. One, we can't give advice. Direct on, advice, on personal this advice. Podcast. That's right. And two, quite often we're making a whole bunch of assumptions. So yep. uh, if you could clear up a bit of that for us, Andrew, we might be able to circle back and, um, and tidy up the edges on that one. So uh, book for you, Andrew. Here's one from Nisha, N-I-S-H-A, Ben. Hopefully I'll uh, pronounce it right. Name. Hi, guys. If anybody has to buy an old investment property within the $500,000 limit in 2019, then should one buy before the election or after the election? Considering the fact that the price of a property can fall further after the election, what's your thought about it? Cheers, Nisha. Interesting. Quick. Okay. Yeah, okay. You lots, of, lo lots of people have the same uh, thoughts, Ben. What should we do with yeah. the election near? Um, but at that price point, Ben, it, going back to what we talked about at the top of the show, yep. at 500000 it's not as if that particular price point, if you are um, within a, 
a, a capital city job market, for example, it's not as if it's going to go raging backwards if negative gearing um, uh, rules get changed because you've still got a lot of people who will uh, be moving into the country, a lot of people who still want to buy, even though 70% of the market is for owner-occupiers, not investors. So I, what we're saying to clients is, why don't you get yourself into a situation where you can get grandfathered on the existing rules for negative mm-hmm. gearing so that going forward, those rules can't be changed yeah. on what you have. Because if you get to the election, and you, I think there's more likely to be an election bump rather than an election dip, even in the fact that if everyone sees that they are going to change, all of a sudden you're going to create this scenario where demand is going to increase. And so you've now got this opportunity now, while there's a bit of uncertainty, to lock in particularly at that price point. If it was a million and a half, maybe different, but 500,000. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Bryce. I think at the end of the day, I want to be buying when there's less competition. Right. Now, when's the, the biggest amount of less competition? coming up to an election mm-hmm. with a most likely probable change of government. Mm-hmm. Right, you get those two things lining up. Now, let's say, so let's run through the, the possible scenarios, right? So you, you're only, there's only two governments that can get in. So Labor get in. So there's three scenarios here. Labor gets in and everyone then says, right, they're in. I'm going to rush to the gates. And so that increases by demand. So if you're in before the election, you didn't have all those extra borrowers, uh, the extra buyers yeah, coming in. That's right? the bump. That's the bump, right? There's the bump. Then they announce when their changes are going to be proposed, or they just, this is the other two pieces for Labor. They just give up on the policy, or they pretend that they're trying for it because it was an election promise and they needed the, the money that they said they were going to get from it, or they just let it die on the vine, right? Or they push it through, but not really, right? Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden, you'll still get a little bump because there'll be people like, well, it's still, you know, they've got a mandate, they're gonna introduce this thing. So you'll get a demand bump for those people who wanna buy existing properties and get the, um, the negative gearing grandfathered. Now, if they surprise and do a, a shifty and try to get it in, let's say, 1st of July 2019, 2019 then, then you could be surprised and you're just done. Yeah. yeah. So hence another reason to potentially go earlier. Right, so I think the probability of of all the things that I look at, obviously liberals getting in, no change, but maybe a bit of a a spike in confidence back into the business community and a bit more business investment and job security. So all of those things would bow to a better situation and both parties are going to give us tax cuts. So that's gonna mean there's more money in our pockets every every week. So, you know, I think on balance, um, everything, I'd be going earlier rather than later. Um, and, we're, we're, and we're already seeing some of the auction clearance rates, even though it's on lower numbers, there's definitely buyers in the market. I think we'll find that the bottom has been sort of closer to last year than, than what we're seeing now, right? I, I just fe- I've just got this feeling that um, with interest rates about to come down as well, that's gonna bring in even more buyers into the market as well. So if I was going, it's this sort of next three or four months would be part of that window that I'd be looking. Good one, Ben. I'm going to throw this one in from David G because it's almost the same question, but it gives us another chance to give away another book. Hi, Bryce and Ben. Biggest challenge is uncertainty around changes to tax policies if there's a change of government. To nail it right down, when they would come into effect is the biggest question. Probably the fact everyone's in wait and see mode makes this a great time to buy if there's a time to get in ahead. Thanks for the great podcast. Relevant and timely. Cheers, David. That's David G. So Couldn't have said it better myself, David. <laughs> so therefore, we snuck another book in there. How are we going for time? I have us one more. No, she's winding me up. Uh, this one's from Michelle <laughs> Wheelermaker. Staying the course, patience, and not getting distracted into other strategies that aren't part of the original plan. It was just a comment, Ivis. That means we can give one another book there. <laughs> Here's one from Dicko Thomas. Going against the crowd consensus, Ivis. It's just a statement again. It's another way to give away another book. And Ben, I reckon um, that is us done today. Beautiful. Um, but today, Ben, my life hack yes. is tips. So previously, I've been uh, on the mission to get everyone to do the seven-day flow. It's part yes, of our you've book. done well. Now we're going to do. Uh, we're going to pivot a little bit around the the biggest enemy of surplus in any household. Ben is the misappropriation of credit card use. Hundred so, percent. So uh, some tips on running the credit card account today, uh, and, and regular podcast listeners will know to not use the credit card for living and lifestyle expenses, Ben, but it is the biggest area that I personally see in the clients that I've uh, helped 
where they use the credit card for disc discretionary spend. If you can avoid that, uh, put all of your discretionary spend on the seven day float that we've been talking about in the last few podcasts and avoid putting on the credit card, you've got to avoid at all costs, Ben. Just don't do it. Um, years of experience and hundreds of clients later, Ben, we mm, haven't seen anyone who, of clients later. who who has uh, ignored this rule. We have not seen them prosper, Ben. We, in fact, we've seen them get into a case where they're robbing Peter to pay Paul and all of a sudden they're changing balances over and they've got credit cards. I remember someone being very, very embarrassed and they got $72,000 worth of credit card debt, Ben, and they couldn't work how they got there. You get there one transaction at a time, Ben, gradually, mm -hmm. gradually into these credit card messes. So if you do have to spend more, then you've allocated for whatever reason, Ben, don't put it on the credit card, go straight to your primary account. If you use the credit card, it will render the money smart system useless in trapping surplus cash, Ben. So just follow the rules. Don't use the credit card for discretionary spend. Love it. Well over. said. Well said. Over. Well, we've did got you this. Know? Well, well, we've got, did you know? Did um, you know? Last week I promised that we're close yeah. on our little yeah. surprise, our announcement around cash flow management. Woo, just I, wait. I, I, I did remember that yeah, you made. Yeah. I was very nervous so about next that week, early crow. Next week, I'm. I'm still going to keep people in suspense this week. <laughs> so you just have to wait till oh, next week. I thought you were about to deliver. No, no, next week, and even if it's not ready next week, I'll tell you about it next week. <laughs> All right. I don't like people, keeping people in too much suspense. Bryce, did you know? No, I didn't. So on the same theme, oh. I'm also referring back to my the great book by Dr. Hans Rosling, yep. Factfulness. You know the book that I read over Christmas and yep. all this great stuff in here? Did you read the whole book? I've read the whole book, Bryce. I've read the whole book. That's a first for me. Mm -hmm. um, slow change is not no change. Ooh. So coming back to mindset and what's happening over time, slow change is not no change. Sure. All right, so let's put this in the context. So Bryce, back in 1900, how much of the world's earth was protected in terms of forests and, and natural environment was protected? Okay, so in other words, there was officially protected. So they had some type, that's a park, that's a national park, that's a word heritage list area. What percentage in the 1900, so we're going back to 1900, how much of the world's great forest and resources were protected? I've got no idea. So can you give me a clue? Is it well, on the high end or the low end? It's less than 1%. Okay, that's what I was going to say. Less than 1%. Yeah, so it was back in those times. Yeah, sure it was. <laughs> sure it was. 0 0.03 of 1%. Right. Right, so 0 0.03 0 of 1% percent, okay, yeah. of the world's land service was protected. By 1930, it was 0 0.2. So we've gone from 0 0.03 to 0 0.2. Yep. Slowly, slowly, decade by decade, forest one forest at a time, the number has climbed. The annual increase was absolutely tiny, almost... Um, Impredictable in terms of just no movement, but there. Remember, slow change is not no change. Today, a stunning how much, Bryce? How much? Did as you in know? today, as in uh, early what 2000s? percentage? What percentage now of the Earth surface is protected? Um, <laughs> I'll play along. Um, half a percent, Ben. Half a percent. Yeah. 15%, Bryce. 15%. 15%. So I always, I always feel like I get set up for a, <laughs> just a slap on Ben's did you know? Yep, 15% was my next guess. Yeah. Now, and, and back in the third century BC, mm -hmm. so the very first person was King, I have no idea, Tissa from Sri Lanka. No, it's King Devanyampia Tissa in Sri Lanka was the first person to declare a piece of forest as officially protected back in the third century BC. So it took us 2,000 years before a European in West Yorkshire got a similar idea. Okay, then it took another 50 years before Yellowstone National Park. So these are the gradual things that started to change. Now we've got 15% and it is still climbing. We are still saying, hey, this needs to be preserved. Let's lock it away from human development. That's all good signs. So remember, slow change is not no change at all. And the world is getting to be a better place subject to the media onslaught you get where it feels like it's getting worse. It's not.
book down. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. I'm glad you circled that in the end because I'm thinking this is all good, but uh, where's it going? But you're saying let's let's be optimistic. Be optimistic. Don't, Same with don't dial into the 24-hour news cycle. There's plenty. Well, Same with the psychology of the buyer, Bryce. Mm. Like if we had a time lapse on Melbourne and you roll that from 1850, it would look like, you know, depending on how slow your time lapse was, doesn't feel like anything's happening. Mm -hmm. But then you start to see regional cities and cities connecting and then the city growing bigger and then high rise starts coming in. That is progress, that's population. And that's value, that's creating value. People wouldn't build the buildings if they were, if they were worth less than what they originally paid for them. Mm. They just would not do it, mm. all right? So ultimately that's circling back to what we're saying here is that it's hard to see, you know, when you're thinking about your next month, your next three months, it's really hard to see as an investor where property prices are gonna go. But if you lift your eyes and you look at the next decade and the next decade and the next decade, and you say to yourself, is people gonna to wanna to live here? Is there a good enough amenity here? We got water, we got food, we got shelter, We've got good lifestyle and drivers, we've got safety, security, we've got a great living standard, people will come and they'll put pressure on moving into those areas where they can be part of a tribe, part of a community and celebrate their love for a great city. That's how it works. Very good, Ben. And uh, then when you do all those sorts of things you talked about and in some point in the future, someone can say, geez, you were lucky that you invested back in <laughs> yeah. 2019. Yeah, Geez, yeah. you were lucky. Mm -hmm. But uh, luck is where opportunity meets preparation, Ben. So there's opportunity now, are you prepared? So I there love you go. it. Hey, um, uh, we wanna shout out and say thank you very much, Ben, to Willow, uh, to Luke, to Mark, to Joel, to Andrew, and also Andrew Love. Michelle, Dicko. Nisha, Michelle, Dicko, very good, and David. So reach out to the Stig, we will get a book to you. And thanks very much for everyone who participated over the last couple of weeks in our Q&A. I mean, I think we might do that. We'll put it out on Facebook. So if you aren't part of our Facebook community, Ben, go to thepropertycouch.com. Uh, don't even go to .com, Ben. Just go to Facebook <laughs> and then go to The Property Couch. Uh, like us, Ben. Yep. And we will do these shout outs. And if you want your question answered, we'll give away books and we'll make sure you're part of it. Ben, Beautiful. But, uh, thanks for bringing your A game today. Until next week, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Very well said. See you next week, folks. Folks, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Just a quick reminder that this is general advice only and you should always consult a professional advisor before making any investment decisions. And if you haven't had the chance to go back to the foundational episodes, we've got good news for you. Go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and check out the free binge guide which gives you the insights you need from the first 20 episodes where we unpack the foundational pillars of the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. It's completely free and available now.